it, it just started out kind of out of nowhere. And I was having some autoimmune type things like fibromyalgia and rosacea in my cheeks and stuff. And, but I mean, a lot of women have that. And uh, I was home with my daughter one day and drinking just a smoothie in the living room. And I had a history of anaphylaxis to shellfish, but I hadn't had an attack in years and years. I just kind of kept those EpiPens around obligatory, you know, because you're supposed to, but I'd never used one. I'm in the living room and I start having difficulty breathing and swallowing and I'm a nurse and I was like, holy cow, this is anaphylaxis. So I gave myself my EpiPen, my son drove me to the hospital and it's, it was a small town we were in and I knew the nurse who was checking me in and I won't say her name, but when she was checking me in, I thought, oh man, I'm in trouble. <laughs> she's got no idea what she's doing. And uh, she's, she said, well, why did you come? You know, you took your EpiPen, what'd you come to the hospital for? And I thought, wow, you don't even know the basic protocol for anaphylaxis. You take your EpiPen, you go to the hospital. So she's like, we're waiting on a bed for one of the rooms. So I'm just going to set you here in the hallway. We'll get to you soon. <laughs> you know, and that's a person that goes, I mean, I'm a critical care nurse. That person goes right to the trauma bay because you may end up having to intubate. So I'm in the hallway. I've got Strider, which is, <gasps> you know, and people are just walking around doing their thing. I'm dying. Give myself another shot of my EpiPen. And finally, the PA looks over and is like, she's not looking so hot. They get me in a room. And at this point, we don't have an IV or anything. And I'm crashing fast. Don gets there and they move me into trauma. And uh, they can't get an IV because when you have anaphylaxis, everything kind of clamps down. And so uh, it's just going from bad to worse. And Don's like, if you don't do something, she's going to die. You need to intubate her. They said, oh no, we've got plenty of time. And it was immediately after that, that I just quit breathing. And it's funny because I popped out of my body so I could see what was going on. And so I'm kind of watching and I'm thinking, man, who is that girl? She's, she's pretty sick. I didn't, I was, it was so, I was so depersonalized. I didn't realize that was me. So they intubated me and then, and then everything was just black for a while. The next thing I remember, I kind of materialized in the back seat of my sister's car and she was driving from Wisconsin to Kentucky and she was at this gas station. She had pulled over and it was pouring rain and I knew my my body felt weird, like not solid or and I couldn't feel my bottom and my legs against the seat and that seemed odd and I just couldn't sort out what was going on. So uh, I'm in the back seat of her car and I see her clothes and they don't match. And I'm thinking, what on earth is she wearing? She looks ridiculous. You know, and I sensed something was wrong. Why is she driving in this pouring rain? She should be home. Maybe something's happened with one of the kids. And, and I saw her pull her phone out. She got onto Facebook and she typed, um, hang on or hang in there, kiddo, I'm coming. And then I popped back out of her car and I was just in this dark void. I was in this expanse that was so dark and it seemed limitless to me as far as its space and there was an oppressive nature to it and I wonder if some of that being on the ventilator um, and the agitation that occurs in a patient even in a coma from being on a ventilator I wonder if I was kind of feeling that on that side because as a nurse it seems to me what people would describe and so um, I had this just oppressive work of breathing, you know, and it, it was like I knew I didn't need to breathe over there, but it still seemed like I had to perform the work. And, um, and I was just stuck there. I couldn't figure out how to get out. And time is really different there. Um, time here is so structured and time there really gets away from you. And so I always tell people if I had to compare this earthly time with the time that I spent in the void, I would say it was probably about 10 years. I, I began to wonder if I had ever really lived. Like maybe I just imagined all of that to have something to think about in that place. I, I just didn't know what was going on, why I was trapped there, what I could do to get out. I would try to move and I'd drag myself forward a little bit and then I'd get so tired and go into what I call the deep sleep where I had no awareness. And I, that kind of went back and forth for a long time. And then finally I started doing some introspection and saying, you know, is there something that I need to understand or learn before I can leave here or, 
or realize that, you know, maybe I did live that life and there's something I'm, maybe it's me, maybe I'm why I'm stuck here. And, uh, and it just occurred to me that the, the spiritual space that I was in was a picture of the spiritual space that I had made on the earth realm. I had kind of, since my divorce many years ago, I had kind of built this wall around myself to protect me and protect the kids. And, you know, a wall's great to protect you, but it also keeps people out and it keeps you in. And so I'd really started to isolate, you know, I mean, I went to work, I took care of my kids, I took care of my house, I went to work, I took care of my kids, I took care of my house. And I stopped putting myself out there. And so the isolation that I had built on this side followed me over. And as soon as I figured out that this was the eternity that I had created, as soon as that realization happened, there was this rumbling and it exploded open. And so now all these little pieces of the darkness, like almost shards, are flying. They're just spinning around and the darkness is pushing further and further away and the spirit comes and I didn't know who she was at first and she's just larger than life orange hair on her head that is so bright it's on fire um, and so there's like these little licks of flame that are her hair and and she's just such an attractive spirit like you I couldn't keep myself from going to her and so I go to her and she holds me against her chest and I realize it's my grandmother and I'm weeping you know, I'm so relieved that someone's there and I'm not alone and the dark is gone and and I'm just overcome and I'm crying and and her energy is just circling around me and mine's still separate, but she's kind of encompassing me. And these shards of the darkness keep trying to get in and they hit her energy and they're flung further away. And, and she's holding me and I'm crying and she says telepathically because they don't speak, but she says, calm yourself, dear one. And the words were like, if any of the people who watch this have ever been given like morphine or fentanyl or whatever, IV for surgery, you know, um, that immediate rush that you get that's like super relaxing and you can feel everything. That's what it was like. It was like a chemical. I felt it acting on her words, her, the intention of those words acted on every cell in my body. And I just immediately relaxed and kind of melted into her and and just, I mean, her energy was just amazing. I could feel her loving me. And I asked her, I said, am I dead? And she said, oh, no, no, you, she said, it's like you learned in science. Energy can't be just created or destroyed. It just changes forms. It's true here too. So you don't die. You either are alive on the earth side or you're super alive on this side. And it's just this transition. And she said, you are kind of in between. And there's a little cord that's holding you to your living side. And if you wanted to go back to that, you could. And I thought, okay, well, that makes sense. And, you know, she just kind of loved on me for a little while. And, and I was just floating in this light and I didn't realize she had gone. And all of a sudden there was this like rumbling, thundering and like this, presence shook everything that ever had been or ever would be every every planet in the cosmos just was rumbling with this energy and i could feel it in my bones and i knew something big was coming and i never saw a person um and i always refer to god as he just because the energy felt very masculine to me but I, I mean, I can't say with certainty that this was a man that, and I don't think God is a man. I think it's, I, I don't know. He was this mix of masculine and feminine because he was nurturing, but that power makes you think, you know, at least me as a traditional person, it makes me think of a man. You know, he came to me and I heard him say this telepathic thing. He said, I am. And that was it. That's all he had to say. I'm like, man, you're the stuff. You just come up to somebody and say, I am. And you're like, yeah, you are. There's a resonance and it's the key of D is what it sounded like to me. And um, no, it's hard to talk about. Um, it just had this vibration to it that was alive that just went through me. 
and it was I could feel it just coursing through every part of me and and so I'm there with them and immediately I, I got kind of scared I'm like oh no I wasn't ready for this he's gonna look at all the stuff that I'm I've done wrong that I'm so ashamed of and and you know he wasn't judging me he was like super loving and everything but I just I just it was like being naked in front of a crowd I just was wanting to kind of hide and and he kind of soothed me in that and I knew we were going to go through my life and so here I'm dreading stuff like a kid you know worried about the parents reading their diary or something and all those things that I was so worried about that I was dreading never came up what the heck right I think I had probably beat myself up enough about those and so these other things came up and first he showed me the good and all of the things that I've done that I feel really good about did not come up. And uh, the things that came up were, there was a scene in the grocery store that I had forgotten about. I mean, probably when my kids were little. There was a woman in line in front of me and she was short just a couple dollars to pay her bill. And um, she was trying to figure out what to put back. And and I just knew what it was like to be in that position as a young mom. and. And I said, it's okay, it's okay, I've got it. And I gave her the money. And it immediately, so I'm seeing this scene like I'm there, and immediately it flashes forward and I see this woman um, working in a food pantry. And she's blessing these, these people with food. And God's showing me, he's like, I want you to see the ripple effect of every little act of kindness. And I saw that and I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And, uh, and then we went through some of the negative things. And the one thing that really stuck with me was that um, of all the things I've done in my life that I'm not proud of, the thing that was shown to me is the, probably the hardest thing to never do again. And it was to control my thoughts about other people. And God showed me, he said, let me explain something to you. So a thought has a certain measure of energy to it. And a word has even more and an action has more than that. But it all starts with a thought. What you think about is what you talk about is what you end up doing. And so you, it, it starts here, you gotta control your thoughts and your heart. And, and so he showed me um, these negative thoughts that I had had about people and they were deserved, let me tell you, these were some jerky people. So he showed me that when you have a negative thought about that person, that energy goes out there and it attaches itself to that person and you contribute to the jerk that that person is. Now you've attached more of that energy to them. This is why forgiving is so important. So when you forgive people, people say, oh, it's not for them, it's for you. It, it is for them because if they don't receive some measure of forgiveness, that energy is still attached to them and it can't come away. The energy's gotta go somewhere. You know, energy isn't created or destroyed. It just changes form. So when you have a thought so if I think something negative about you, that thought attaches itself to your spirit and it makes you more the person that you are, that I'm thinking you are. And when I forgive you, that energy is able to be redirected. And so that little bit of negative that I put on you that made you more the negative person that you are now comes off because I've forgiven you. And so it's really important to that other person's journey for you to forgive them. And it's really important to you because not only does that negative energy go and attach to them, but it attaches to you and energy attracts energy. So if you're harboring all of these negative feelings about people, even if they're well-deserved, you're just drawing more of it to you because that energy isn't attached to you. And wow, I mean, that's life-changing information. You know, here I am with this loving creator who's kind of let all the big stuff go that I was really worried about. And then I suddenly become angry with him. And I realized I'd been angry with God for a long time. And I told him, I said, you know, you say you're this loving God and, and you want the best for your children. And I call bull crap. Um, you know, and you can just be so honest. I love that. I've seen what, what you've allowed my own children to go through. And I said, here their dad abandons them when they're just babies. And you know, him leaving me was hard enough I mean, and not deserved. And and for him to abandon his own children. And I thought, you know, I can take whatever he did to me, but watching those kids, you know, talk to him on the telephone and then go to the mailbox every day to check for a gift that he said he was gonna send that's never coming. And watch them walk back heartbroken every day. 
what kind of God allows that? You know, I said, it would have been easier on all of us. And this is terrible to say, but it would have been easier if he died because I could have told the kids this story about what a wonderful man he was and how much he loved them. And they would have at least had that. But now they've got this man that's alive that is failing them in every way. And of course, children take that on and attribute it to something being wrong with them. And I really had held that against God and I was bitter and I wanted to be mad at him. No, I mean, I was kind of balled up about it. And uh, he said, oh, you've completely misunderstood me. And he said, let me show you something. And we flash forward and we're sitting in the bleachers. David, my oldest son is sitting to my right. Now, when I had the experience, my grandson was two. So David's sitting to my right and Cole's older. He's like five or six, my grandson is. And we're watching him play soccer. And he's running up and down this field and the sun's on his hair. And you know that magic of just just kids, you know, just, there's just something about it. And he's running up and down the field and I just seeing him in his strong body and his, you know, his hair. And he's just, I mean, just magic. It's just magic. And, and David looks at me and he says, mom, I'm never gonna get through this. He says, mom, I'm gonna be the dad to him that I deserved. If, if it took his dad leaving for him to make that commitment, I get it, you know, it's been worth it. And I gotta say, he's been that dad. And it's so funny because a couple years later, Cole's playing soccer. <laughs> Who would have known that at two, right? Cole's playing soccer and David looks at me and he says, mom, I'm gonna be the dad to him that I deserve. I mean, it just sucks the air out of you. I'm like, oh my gosh, that happened. And it was this confirmation from God you know, you were here. There's times you doubt that near-death experience because so many people doubt it. And he's like, no, you were here and, and I'm making manifest the things that I promised you. And I'm just like, wow. The other thing I learned there was we have this really screwed up definition of good and bad. To us, good is when nothing is wrong and everything is right. And in the spiritual realm, good is forward motion no matter how awful it feels. So you're moving forward, you're growing, um, you know, you're affecting the lives of other people, even if you're doing it through grief or, uh, you know, whatever, that's considered good up there. He's like, yep, you're doing good work, even though all the circumstances around it suck. You're, you're still good, it's not bad, you're moving forward. Now, the day that you start sitting in that recliner and you stop interacting with the world and you're just in that, um, you know, I'm going to do what makes me comfortable. That's bad, even though nothing bad's happening. Not what we're here for. We weren't here to be sedentary creatures that have no effect on the world around us. There's no point in you being here if that's what you're going to do. You know, I learned when I was over there that before we come to this life, um, there's actually a decision-making process that we go through with some consultation um, of spirit guides and things like that about what family we want to come to and what general lessons we'd like to learn while we're here. And I think we know the whole story before we come. I think we forget it when we get here. I try to remind people that, of that because before you came, you knew what traumas you were going to face. And you were like, that's the life I want to live. I want to have those lessons because those are going to contribute to the growth of my spirit and the way it needs to grow. And so this higher you, these decisions here that are terrible, and here they're awful because this life, we perceive it as being really a long time. But I gotta tell you, when I pulled out of my body, this, this seemed like it had been over like that. People say, well, what about kids with cancer that are suffering? Or what about kids that are born horribly deformed? And, and I, I just tell them, I'm like, those are the most sacrificial spirits. Those are the ones on the other side that said, I'll come void of even the ability to communicate just so I can show people a love that transcends speech. So, you know, I'm in this light and this kind of healing process begins where the light comes through my feet and it just starts creeping up through my body. And it's, it's healing every little cell that it comes in contact with spiritually. You know, it goes through my stomach and it goes through my chest and it's so powerful I can just feel this energy coming up through me and it gets to my tongue and these beautiful songs come out, you know, that 
I, I can't stop. God's energy shot out my eyelashes and it was so bright. And it was like looking at the sun without having any pain or your eyes dilate even and no heat or anything. And so it, I tried to close my eyes because I didn't want any of the energy to get out. And so I'm closing my eyes and it shoots out my eyelashes and it, it goes out into the expanse and turns around and comes back. I can feel it going through the little curves in my brain. And, and then I feel like I get to this more core part of myself and God's there. And it blew me away. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Do you mean to tell me you've been in there all the time? You're not this external thing? And he's like, well, I'm kind of both. And I'm like, so all of us, even the people that don't believe, God is in there. And he's like, you can't take me out any more than you could take out your own father's DNA. I made you, I'm in there, you know, and, and you can choose to not acknowledge me. You can choose to walk around saying your dad's not your dad, but we can prove he is. I'm telling you, I'm in there and, and I'm just waiting to love you. And, you know, even through all of this crap you're going to go through, and I went through some hell there for a while, it, you know, and, and I've had a lot of trauma in my life and, and it just, he kind of melted all of that away. And, and I started realizing I was going to have to make this decision about going back. And there was a point, um, actually when I was still in the void that I, act I, I was able to progress and move and see myself in my hospital room. And so I see myself lying there in a coma and I saw my daughter there. I knew what she had worn that day um, and was able to describe that back to her. I knew what part of the room she'd stood in. So I get to this point where I'm in the light with God and, and I have to come back. And it seemed like a decision that I probably had made before I was born, that I'd known this was going to happen and that I was going to choose to go back because I because I hadn't lived the life I was supposed to live. I not even close. In fact, I had avoided doing the things I was supposed to do. I can't tell you how heartbroken I was to leave. And Don says to me, you know, my husband's like, you know, well, why would you not want to come back to me? And I'm like, I, I can't make you understand that. Until you've been there, you just can't understand it. I knew you'd be okay eventually. And so I made that decision to come back and, and I was crying and and I told God, I said, at least let me remember it. Because if I can't remember this, I don't think I'll have any hope. And I woke up, I was off the ventilator, my sister was standing there. And the first thing I said was I was with God. And the nurse came in and she called the doctor and I'm in St. Joseph Catholic Hospital. And the first person they send in to see me is a psychiatrist. <laughs> You can't see God. And so they wrote that I was having delusions and, you know, and that stuff follows you. <laughs> and I thought that's just, I just couldn't get over the irony of that. It's interesting the response you get when you have a near-death experience, because I think as a believer, um, as somebody who believed in God beforehand, I just assumed that all of my friends that were religious would be the ones that wanted to hear the story. The people that I have gotten the hardest time from have been the religious folks. And I always try to remind people because I do understand what their reservation is. You know, I tell about this, this dark and empty void that I was in and they're like, well, wait a minute, you're a Christian. You should have gone right over to heaven. And I think I've figured that out. A near death experience is not a death experience. You know, I think God knows you're only going to be there a short while. He knows you're going to decide to go back because you're not done yet. So I think the near-death experience is tailored to the experiencer with what they need so that they can go back and overcome some things that are hindering them in their life. That's not the same experience you're going to give somebody who's coming to stay. So for all of the folks who are Christians who are like, well, you didn't see Jesus and all these other things, you know, I was just there for a little visit. And those little visits aren't like, a, aren't like moving in. I'm in the back seat of her car and I see her clothes and they don't match. And I'm thinking, what on earth is she wearing? She looks ridiculous. Why is she driving in this pouring rain? She should be home. And I saw her pull her phone out. She got onto Facebook and she typed, um, hang on or hang in there, kiddo, I'm coming. Well, it was funny because when I woke up, 
she was there at the hospital and I said, I saw what you typed on Facebook. And of course there was no way I could have known that, but um, it really freaked her out. <laughs> I said, why were you wearing that outfit? And she said, well, when I got the call, I just grabbed whatever clothes were on the end of the bed and I threw them on and threw some stuff in a bag and I left. And, and that's why I was mismatched. And she verified the, the, the pouring rain and pulling over and, and all of that stuff. So there's no question that I saw that. If you'd like to see more of Penny's interview, there's a full unedited interview right here, or there's a link in the description you can click on. And it's about 30 more extra minutes of her talking about other experiences she had on the other side. Very cool.